Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the next of the IEA uh, webinars. And this particular one, which I think is a really important one on what is human factors and ergonomics. And I think uh, many of us who are involved in the discipline have stories of uh, people being confused, uh, particularly when we travel on an airplane and we say, uh, we are ergonomists and they say, what is that? And people get confused as to what it exactly is. And so I think this is a vital webinar that we are doing today. And so we wish you a very warm welcome to this webinar. My name is Andrew Todd from Rhodes University in South Africa, and I am the moderator for this session. And we have three fantastic speakers lined up for you today, and I will introduce them to you very shortly. Uh, please, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please put them into the Q&A and we will answer them as we go and we will facilitate some discussions uh, of those questions once all three of the speakers have presented today. What we're really wanting to try and achieve with this webinar is to provide some clarity on perhaps the history of where human factors and ergonomics has come from and where we are going through the three presentations that we're going to have. And I think a nice starting point to that is the quote that I have at the bottom of this uh, opening slide, where the reality when we're trying to understand humans and their work is that humans respond according to how they interpret the conditions under which they must labor. And that becomes a cornerstone of how we go about actually trying to implement human factors and ergonomics. So what is this discipline of HFE? As a starting point, historically, one of the key areas of interest has been physical factors. This is where we look at the anatomical, physiological, and anthropometric and biomechanical characteristics of humans and the demands that tasks, particularly physical tasks, place with on those characteristics of humans. Historically, this has very often been referred to as ergonomics and takes this very physical perspective to trying to understand humans and their work environments and focus primarily on the physical systems of work. Much of the work in this is, comes either from a kinesiology or an engineering perspective. While at the same time, we haven't only just had a focus on these physical factors, we've also had a focus on cognitive factors, on human perceptions, human memory, human reasoning, human motor responses. This historically has often been referred to as human factors and coming more from a psychological perspective. Now, historically, these two factors have often been looked at independent of each other where we focus just on the physical factors or just on the cognitive factors without recognizing the important interaction that occurs between these two and an acknowledgement of the profound influence that each of these have on each other and on the overall response to any activity that we are doing. In other words, there is no such thing as a purely physical task or no such thing as a purely cognitive task. And in fact, there is a strong interaction between these two. And over time, and since the 1990s, we have also started to recognize that it's not just cognitive factors and physical factors. In other words, work does not occur in isolation, but it occurs within context. And so organizational factors such as autonomy, cooperation, the socio-technical characteristics of the system within which work occurs, are all going to have an influence upon both the physical and the cognitive factors. The key to starting to understand what human factors and ergonomics is, is that all three of these are interacting with each other. And that if we want to truly understand human work, we can no longer afford to sustain an artificial distinction between physical factors, cognitive factors, and organizational factors. And so you'll see on the IEA website that we always refer now to human factors and ergonomics or ergonomics and human factors. 
And really what we've tried to do is to acknowledge that those don't exist in isolation and that HFE as a discipline is about the interaction between the physical, cognitive, and organizational factors. What are we suggesting here? We are suggesting that human factors and ergonomics is a multidisciplinary science, and you'll see that coming through in the backgrounds of the presenters today. We are a multidisciplinary science that looks to optimize the interaction between humans and all the other elements of the system, whether they are physical, cognitive, or organizational in, in, uh, uh, perspective. And in fact, even more broadly than that, whether they are environmental factors, factors related to sustainability. And so these are the three core traditional perspectives, but we are obviously building and growing on that. And really what we are interested in as a science is the interaction between humans and these other elements of the system for the dual outcomes of ensuring system performance and human well-being. And it is our argument that if we ensure human well-being, balancing the demands of the work with the capabilities of the human, we also look after the system performance and optimize the performance of the system. So what this means as a systems orientated discipline, in other words, is that we are interested in these global systems and that in order to do that for the practitioner in human factors and ergonomics, we require levels of competency across these various aspects of what we are looking at. All ergonomists need to have a baseline minimum requirement and understanding of these various domains that we look at. And you'll see this coming through. We need to understand the physical factors, the organizational factors, as well as the uh, cognitive factors, plus these broader systems within which ergonomics exists. That isn't to suggest that you can't have a main domain of specialization or expertise. And again, you see that coming through from our presenters today. And so what we're gonna do this afternoon then is to take these three core ideas and concepts within the systems that HFE looks at and give you three brief presentations on physical factors, cognitive factors, and organizational factors and how these interact with each other to try and understand system performance and human well-being. We're going to do that by starting with a presentation from uh, Professor Stephen Fisher from the University of Waterloo in Canada in the Department of Kinesi Kinesiology and Health Sciences. Uh, Stephen is also involved heavily with the IEA and in particular involved with uh, the uh, technical committee. So IEA has a large number of technical committees. One of our most active ones is the technical committee for musculoskeletal disorders. So Stephen, thank you very much for giving of your time today. Uh, I would like to hand over to you to present on uh, the physical factors components of HFE. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Andrew. Andrew, can you just give me a quick thumbs up to confirm you can see my slides? Can Wonderful. Yeah, you will. Start my timer here. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining today and, and for listening in and learning a little bit more about human factors ergonomics. Uh, always exciting to have these conversations and uh, it's great for me as somebody that specializes in the physical factors element. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the presentations from my colleagues as well as we continue to to work together to integrate these different uh, different areas of practice to help solve more global challenges around systems and, and human performance. So I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about physical factors and ergonomics. And I'll start with this diagram here. Um, so in Canada, uh, I'm affiliated with the Association for, for Canadian Ergonomists, or ACE, uh, and we're a, an affiliate with the IEA. Uh, and we've worked really hard, again, like we're doing today, to help communicate the, the breadth of, of human factors ergonomics in terms of the physical, organizational, and cognitive demands. Uh, so I really like this is just kind of a simple diagram to, to get us started in, in, in how we're thinking about this. But what I really want to focus on is the physical today. 
And I'm going to walk through uh, briefly two case examples just to showcase the types of types of problem spaces that a physical factors ergonomist might focus in, again, with some intersections into the organizational and cognitive elements that you'll see. But to set the stage here, I'm going to simplify this down really into two, uh, to two components. So what we're really talking about here is who can do it? And should it be done? If I can really kind of kind of simplify down to physical ergonomics. And when we say who can do it from the physical ergonomics uh, standpoint, what we're really thinking about is, you know, who can reach, who can see, uh, who can fit. So thinking about the anthrop anthropometrics or body shapes and sizes and how that impacts design and function and performance within a system. So I'll walk through one example today that's largely around understanding fit and ensuring that products, devices are designed so that they're accessible to folks that might have a large range of variation in, in body shapes and sizes and, and capabilities from maybe a vision or reach perspective. The other side of this, again, I'm, I'm simplifying, but it's really, should it be done? So when we think of, you know, should the task be done? Should the work be done? Should the product interaction occur? Uh, should the human interact with the system in this particular way? When viewed from the physical uh, physical factors lens, we're thinking of things like injury risk. You know, should it be done? Does it increase the likelihood that somebody might develop a, a work-related injury, for example? Does it increase the risk of fatigue and maybe a fatigue-related error or or something that uh, causes a challenge to quality in terms of the, the products being built or, or the quality of the outcome of the process that the human is engaged in? So I, I like to boil it down into these two simple areas as I, I think just a way to think about the physical factors. Who can do it? Should it be done? Now, two guiding principles to all of this is that it's human-centered. So when I mentioned who can do it, we're really thinking about humans and all the shapes and sizes and variations that humans come in. So we definitely want to be inclusive to that. And uh, training in physical factors, ergonomics, we spend a lot of time, you know, understanding how to, to quantify shape sizes and make sure we can match that to, to human system interactions. But also that it's criteria-based. So anybody that's familiar with the ISO standard, uh, 26800, I believe, talks about ergonomics as a process. And one of the clear requirements is its requirements based. So when we're thinking about injury risk, do we have requirements there? Like what, what separates you know, an elevated level of risk that we're not willing to uh, be comfortable with versus a level of risk that we are willing to be comfortable with? Because inevitably, you know, human interactions with any system, there's always some inherent risk, uh, but we're, we're willing to take on more or less of that. But we should have cl clear criteria for what that is. So again, I'll walk through an example of that today. So the first example I want to talk about, this was a really unique project um, as, you know, the world moves to more sustainable, uh, to more sustainable energy consumption. We had a really interesting opportunity to work with a company that was designing an electric scooter. And this particular scooter uh, needed to have a certain amount of payload. So if you can see in the top left or the top right, there's almost like a little trailer. Uh, underneath that is, is a number of batteries so that this could be uh, powered uh, using electricity, which is fantastic. But given the diversity of folks that might be uh, using this particular scooter, it was really important to understand how shapes and sizes and anthropometry of different prospective users could impact that design. So we're using a tool here, a digital human model, just a, a, a computer representation. You can almost think of it as a video game, a computer representation of a human. And what we can do is I just scan through the slides here is we can explore what if scenarios. So what you're seeing on the slide here is, well, what if we move the steering wheel in a whole bunch of different places? And again, for example, if I put the steering wheel, you know, way up in the air, out in front, and what we can do is explore the range of positions and postures that somebody with that shape might take. And we can map this and I have a, you know, a little red, green, yellow, blue characteristic here. And What's important is that when the steering wheel centroid is kind of in this green area, it's allowing that rider with that body shape to you know, posture themselves in a position that would be relatively neutral or close to neutral. There's obviously a little bit more that goes on behind the scenes there, but just to simplify for everyone. So if we had it in that green zone, that would be great. It would be you know, great for this particular rider. And as we start to move, obviously, we move out of that zone, we move into some of the red and, and blue zones. But then what's nice is we can also consider, you know, other aspects of the design. Well, 
you know, what about turning radius? How does that impact posture? You can imagine if the steering wheel is too far away and I have to turn that, that right arm really might have to reach quite a distance. So we want to make sure we balance that. And what's great from a physical ergonomics perspective is we're really trying to understand how that user intersects with respect to things like reach, see, fit. So how do they, how do they position in there? But the device isn't just going to be operated by a single individual. It's going to be operated by a, a uh, individuals with a range of body shapes and sizes. So we can run the, the same analysis. And now here I'll use a, a 95th percentile height male. So quite a different size and shape than the female. But again, thinking from a physical ergonomics lens, I can apply the same types of logic. So, you know, I can explore and, and move around. Where would it be best for this particular rider? And what's interesting is, you know, we, if we think of longer limbs, longer segments here, a steering wheel that's actually further away might be better for this particular individual, which underscores why having variation in design can sometimes be quite helpful from a physical ergonomics perspective, uh, thinking about anthropometry, body shapes, and sizes. So again, we can kind of work through the analysis. And again, I'm just, this is a reminder for everybody that this is just an example to showcase uh, the types of questions that we might chase or answer in physical ergonomics. But what's interesting is we can generate data like this and, and note that you know where the, the current steering wheel, the or current location of the handlebars based on the initial design suggested the central location. But what we notice is that's not actually ideal really for either user group. Like it's okay for the small female, but it's really not ideal for the large male. So the design doesn't accommodate as well as it could a diverse population. Now, if we assume for a second that we can't have, you know, some variation, some adjustability in, in handlebar location, which might be a more ideal solution, where could we put the steering wheel so that it best accommodates both? Well, obviously, if we put it way over where the, the large male really would appreciate it, it's not going to work. It's, it's an extended reach for the female. So, but we can use data like this and physical ergonomics analyses to identify that, you know, maybe just taking that centroid location and moving it down and forward a little bit might be in this overlapped area between both females and males. So maybe that's an ideal location if I'm limited to one design option. So that's one case example, particularly around the, you know, who, who can do it? Can we see it? Can we reach it? Can we fit? So that would be one aspect of physical ergonomics. The other aspect, and, and Andrew mentioned this, um, is around you know the biomechanics, the physiology, and this is really important both from a from a health and wellness uh, standpoint in terms of promoting optimal health and 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 conditioning in the workplace, but it's also really important in terms of preventing and mitigating injuries. Uh, I have a picture here of a group of paramedics responding to a call. And we can think of our first responder communities, um, you know, they're really challenged to be in some really unique environments. And perhaps not surprisingly, in many countries, injury rates to first responders are quite high. Um, so what we're trying to support these communities in doing is, well, how can we make those jobs a little bit safer um, from an injury risk perspective? How do we mitigate some of those injuries? So this is another uh, case example where physical ergonomics can be quite useful. So just so we're all on the same page, a bit of a level setting exercise here. What you see here is a paramedic pulling a manual stretcher out of the back of an ambulance. Now, in some jurisdictions in the world, a manual stretcher like this is somewhat archaic. In others, this is very commonplace. This is a common task that a, a first responder paramedic might perform. And with emergent, uh, with changing technologies, a number of solutions were being developed to try to reduce some of the physical hazards. So again, if you're just watching the video on screen, uh, you can see it's almost a push of a button and we've automated, uh, automated out a lot of that physical exposure. But sometimes there's more than one way to solve a problem. So here's another example of another sort of powered approach and from a physical ergonomics perspective, the challenge that we were tasked with is helping the service sort out which of these solutions might be better, which one is better at mitigating some of the risks to injury. Um, and so what you see in the video here is obviously the two bottom videos provide powered solutions. 
So we can mitigate some of that risk and I'll show that in just a moment. But back to Andrew's comment, what we don't wanna do is view these from the physical lens exclusively. So what you notice is if you watch the timing of the video on the left and the timing of the video on the right, the solution on the left is much quicker to deploy. And if you'll notice, she's one-handed, you know, pushing some buttons. If you notice the video on the left, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of questions. So from a cognitive perspective, there's a lot more decision-making that had to happen to use this particular device. So while both probably achieve the purpose from a physical ergonomics lens of reducing the exposures in the body, one imposes a much higher cognitive challenge than the other. So I think this is a really nice example that showcases that intersection. Again, if we were looking at data, one of the metrics that we're commonly interested in in physical ergonomics is loading on the body. <clears throat> so this is an example of compression. So how much compression is on your spine? Uh, we have some thresholds and tolerances there. And just to showcase here, you know, when we can measure these things using the tools we have in our, in our physical ergonomics toolbox, we can clearly demonstrate to that uh, paramedic service that both solutions were really reducing the compressive load on the spine so from purely a physical ergonomics lens. Um, they were both achieving the physical ergonomics criteria of lowering the load. But when contrast with the cognitive, again, as you can see in the video, and we, we can measure this using a number of tools, one solution was much better when we started thinking about the cognitive, uh, cognitive elements. So what we're showing here is we had one service that did not have powered stretchers in the blue line, and they kind of, you know, up and down with their injury rates. They introduced these stretchers and, and saw a pretty substantial decrease in injuries, which was great. That's the impact we'd like to see when we're providing solutions that reduce and mitigate risks from a physical ergonomics lens. We had another service, um, oddly enough, they actually saw a big increase, but they did not, in, they did not purchase powered stretchers. So um, we were able to clearly show that you know, their risks remained high in the absence of powered stretchers. And this was really powerful to showcase because we could help companies make decisions about purchasing, procuring equipment. In this case, where uh, the cost of the equipment would be recovered in 5.8 years, which is less than the seven year service life. So the company would save enough money, we projected in injury reductions, that they would easily pay for the intervention. So not only is it better for uh, the health and well-being of their workforce and for patient outcomes, but it's also financially viable, financially stable. <clears throat> so this was an important contribution uh, from, from our team to help make decisions around technologies and that sort of thing. Now, at least in Canada, uh, where we reside, shortly thereafter, some of this work, there were some fairly large investments. So services were starting to pick this up. Uh, and make some fairly substantial large investments to, to procure this technology. And you'll notice this happens to be the device that was in the left video that not only reduced physical effort, but from a cognitive uh, HFE perspective as well was also more beneficial. For those looking for resources, so if you're, you know, you're in a sector where um, physical exposures, physical hazards, physical ergonomics is a concern, I'd encourage you to check out msdprevention.com. Uh, there's a number of these sites, but this is a, a center that I'm affiliated here with Waterloo and has a number of different resources um, to help assess, understand what criteria could be assessed, what might be important. Um, and then to, to Andrew's point, helps to articulate when you need to bring in somebody with a little bit more expertise versus when you can deploy some of these tools uh, on your own. And with that, uh, I just I'll end off and just before I pass back to Andrew, you know, where does the where is the future going? And I think it's a really exciting time right now, particularly in physical ergonomics, where tools like computer vision uh, are really challenging us maybe to rethink how we monitor exposure, how we measure workers, uh, what types of things we consider. Are there new criteria? Uh, so again, there's certainly an evolution in ergonomics and particularly physical ergonomics practice. Um, so certainly look forward to the future and what it may hold. But with that, I will wrap up and pass it back to Andrew. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Steve, for that uh, fantastic talk. Uh, some really interesting work that you guys have been doing there. And uh, uh, not only interesting, I think also really, really important. And uh, I love that idea of supporting those uh, safety critical jobs uh, in being able to do their jobs more safely. So thank you very much for that.
uh, to the attendees, just a reminder, if you have questions for any of the speakers, uh, we would love to hear from you. Please put them into the Q&A section and we'll be able to engage with them there. So please do ask Steve some questions there. Our uh, next speaker is going to speak on cognitive factors. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Kathleen Mossier, uh, who is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at San Francisco State University and also immediate past president of the International Ergonomics uh, Association and has vast global experience of, of working all <laughs> over the world. So it is really an honor for us to have you here, Kathy. And we really look forward to, to hearing from you about the cognitive factors. So over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, good morning to all of you from California, where it is morning. So I will be drinking some coffee. And let me see if I can share this. Okay, good. All right, and I'm going to talk today uh, about cognitive human factors and ergonomics. And Andrew and Steve both gave some good definitions, but I just want to reiterate a little bit. So human factors and ergonomics is an integrative scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of the system and the profession that applies theory, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize both human well-being and overall system performance. So I want to emphasize this because it, it uh, addresses, again, the integrative nature of human factors and ergonomics and the fact that all of the components of the system, the work system, the uh, practice system, must be taken into account when you're designing for humans. So cognitive ergonomics focuses on mental processes, such as perception, so how do humans perceive things, memory. Uh, have you ever had something that uh, you use that depended on you remembering to do something when it was difficult to remember? On human reasoning, on decision-making, uh, sensory motor responses, and all of these mental processes as they affect the interactions among humans and other elements of a system. Some relevant topics, research topics, include mental workload, uh, skilled performance, how is that acquired? What does that mean? Human computer interaction, which is a biggie these days, human reliability, work stress, and training. As all of these topics relate to human system design. So the approach that we take is human centered and it recognizes the complexity in interaction among all of these elements. So if you look at these pictures, there's a lot going on in them and any system that these people or any people will work in has to recognize the complexity and all of the things that could happen, all of the different sizes of people, all of their different um, ways of interacting, their characteristics. It has to take into account all of these complexities when it's talking about system design. Sorry, it's not going anywhere. Okay. So we have to take into account human perceptual cognitive strengths and limitations, uh, cognitive workload and mental effort. What will this design impose on our cognitive workload and mental effort? Human vigilance and monitoring behavior. And we also need to design our systems to facilitate requirements of system use, such as situation awareness. Do you know what's going on in the environment within which you're interacting? Do you have accurate mental models of what's going on in this system? Do you understand how it works? Um, how are you making decisions? And will this vary depending on whether you're new to the system or whether you've been using it for a long time or the domain? Uh, does your expertise impact how you make decisions and how do you design so that both novices and experts can use the same system. And it also 
has to consider the notion of collaborative work because in a complex environment today, people are often working and performing in teams. So how do you facilitate collaborative work? Some of the design challenges today, for example, uh, and I have to tell you that my field is aerospace, so my examples will come from aerospace. So the abundance of technology that's appearing in aerospace, for example, increases the importance of cognitive human factors in engineering and design. So you, if you look at the cockpit here as a system, you have to make sure that all of the elements are designed with good human factors. Uh, as Steve described, the physiological parts, you have to make sure that the, the seats are set up for pilots of various sizes and shapes and comfort because they have to be um, in them for long stretches of time. So you have to account for physical, the space, the distance between the pilot's um, feet and what he or she is looking at, the visibility of these um, displays that you're using. So you have to take all of these into account. So the design of good work systems must consider the cognitive as well as the physiological factors. One of the things I mentioned was facilitating collaborative work. So how do you make sure that the pilots on the right and left side of the cockpit have the same information and have the same mental model of what's going on in the situation? One of the challenges is that cognitive processes are hard to measure. It's obvious you can do a model that shows placement of controls and um, handles and steering wheels and yokes but how do you measure cognitive processes if you're getting the best of those? And they may vary depending on the expertise of the person involved. So all of these things must be considered and the match between system design and cognitive processing is critical to successful use of the system and avoiding risk of injury, accidents, incidents, errors. You have to pay attention to all of these. Well-engineered systems should protect the human against errors or failures. So all of these considerations are there. Nowadays, you're seeing a lot of uh, so-called smart technology and it's advanced to the point where we need to think about a partnership between intelligent humans and smart machines. So you've got a, a convergence of human cognition and cognitive factors and artificial intelligence automation, um, more or less sophisticated automated work systems. So there are some things that are becoming really important in the design of today's work systems. Uh, one of them is that you have to start thinking about a partnership between intelligent humans and smart machines so that the technology serve the humans rather than controls the humans. And humans are always in control rather than being subservient to the technology. And one of the, the ways that this can be done is by, with respect to cognition particularly, is to capitalize on the human's ability to personalize and customize the work, to draw on their expertise to make decisions and figure out how to do things. Humans are good at thinking critically and creatively. They're good at problem solving. Humans can adapt to changes more easily than machines, and they should be the decision makers. They can make the decisions. So all of these things in terms of cognitive human factors and ergonomics, design needs to capitalize on humans' ability and expertise and superiority over technology. But you also have to capitalize on technology's ability to support and assist humans at work. So if you think of an example, uh, what should this partnership look like? So if I take an example from aerospace, uh, designing human-centric automation for aerospace systems, this has been an ongoing process that started mm, back in the, the 70s when they started to automate aircraft and avionics and aircraft became more and more sophisticated. And an issue that's always been there is how do we divide the tasks? 
how do we use human cognition where we should use human cognition and how do we use automation in the best way and in the best situations for the best overall system well-being and performance. So this is the cockpit of a, of a 787. Um, and it, and this was uh, a few years ago, the most sophisticated oops, um, cockpit. And uh, now they're even getting more so. And things have happened with respect to the instrument displays. If you can see, there are a few uh, computer displays on the screen rather than all of the gauges and um, circular dials and analog displays that you would see in past aircraft. So what are the important things to think of when you're designing human-centric air automation for aerospace systems? One is to keep the human in control and to make sure that the human has the last word. The automation or machines should not be controlling the human. The human should always have override responsibility and capability. You need to keep the human in the loop of what's going on with automated systems that are observable or transparent. So the human operator, the pilot knows what's going on and can observe it being done, doesn't have to dig through displays, uh, multiple layers to figure out what's happening and why the automation is doing a certain thing. It should be understandable and predictable. You should be able to predict what your automated systems are going to do next. And of course, it would needs to be reliable. You need to be able to count on the automation to do what you need it to do. And one of the things that is turning out to be important is that the automation needs to provide process tracing rationale for decision-making and action recommendations. So in the past, when automated systems were first introduced, pilots thought they operated kind of like magic. They never knew exactly why they were doing things and they couldn't follow exactly why, but almost all of the time they did it correctly. So they, they didn't probe too deeply into why and how the automation was doing what it did. But it has become very apparent that in terms of cognitive human factors and ergonomics, you need to be able to trace the processes of the systems that you're using. You need to provide backup cues and information. Uh, those of you that know about the 737 MAX accident, um, one of the issues there was that some of the cockpits didn't have the old displays with some backup information that the pilots could use to figure out, help them figure out what was going on so that they could fix it. It was replaced by a newer display, which didn't give some of the older information. And of course you need to use automation for the tasks that it does best. So automation is really good at accomplishing uh, in some domains, repetitive movements or physically difficult tasks. And you'll see that in the robotization of uh, a lot of industries where robots can do the things that humans are likely to get injured doing. It needs to be able to integrate data gathering and recording for administration. Automation is great at gathering and synthesizing tons of data more fast, quick, more quickly than the human is able to do it and, and oftentimes more accurately. So let the human do things like that. And uh, humans need to be able to um, count on automation to assess and synthesize information for situation assessment, kind of the front end of decision-making so that humans get the information, but then they can make the decision. They're responsible for it. And one of the uh, examples where des the design of the automation kind of fought against the human operator, if you remember the, the landing in the, the Hudson, uh, Captain Sullenberger had to deal with an automation that was not completely transparent. And he did not realize that he had limited control for his pitch when he was coming down into the, to the Hudson. And that was an example of the, the aircraft the system, the work system, not really giving him the information that he was entitled to for making his decisions. And which would have, um, he ended up making, of course, a, a, a great landing and a great save. But it would have been better if he had known exactly what the aircraft was able to do and how it was limiting him. And another important thing when you're designing human automation systems in aviation or anywhere else is that you avoid leftover design. Sometimes the uh, 
people, the designers are encouraged to let automation do whatever it can do. So the idea is that automation should do everything. And if there's something that the automation can't do, or if there's a, a, um, a place where the humans need to be involved, then the humans come in. And the problem with that is that the humans are not in the loop and the humans operators are not uh, uh, cognitively aware of everything that's going on. And they end up doing uh, a subset of tasks that may be either meaningless or maybe just the, the terrible tasks, like they say the aviation uh, airplanes can fly themselves, but whenever there's a big incident or a big failure or a big problem, the humans have to take over. And if the humans haven't been in the loop before that, then it's very difficult for them to take over. So another place where uh, cognitive human factors and ergonomics is going to be really important is when you're designing for remote or multi-agent team collaboration. So I talked to you a little bit about the cockpit and remember that's one part of the system. The rest of the system is on the ground. So you're talking about an, a, an air ground multi-team system with multiple agents. So how do you make sure cognitively in the system that each of these agents and each of these parts of the multi-agent team have the same information. And right now the project that we're working on has to do with uh, earth-based collaboration. So there are even additional challenges in there such as time delays for communication and uh, technological limitations. So how do you design the systems so that they'll be cognitively the best for the operators and will end up um, serving them and cognitive performance. And this old picture can give you a little bit about what happens when you don't consider cognitive human factors and system design. You may end up with humans doing uh, things that are unexpected and the system performance may not be what you expect. So uh, thank you very much. Kathy, thank you for a very enlightening talk as always. And uh, your detailed knowledge of the, the cognitive factors. And, <laughs> and again, that emphasis of uh, uh, in a cockpit, there's physical space and how the physical space in that cockpit plays a role in uh, the, the cognitive demands and, and fatigue, etc. So thank you very much, Kathy. Our last speaker today is a fellow South African uh, Professor Andrew Thatcher, who is Chair of Industrial and uh, Organizational Psychology at the University of Edwardsrand in Johannesburg. He is also involved with the IEA, uh, and in particular here he is Chair of the Task Force, Task Force for the Future of Work. Uh, and Andrew is going to be giving us some ideas around organizational factors and ergonomics. So, Andrew, thank you very much. Over to you. Andrew, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much to Kathy and uh, Steve for their uh, introductions to essentially what I'm going to be talking about, which is an introduction to organizational ergonomics. I apologize to all of the Americans for my English spelling, uh, my British English spelling of organizational throughout my presentation. Um, the basis behind uh, what I'm going to talk about, just as a very basic overview, is to define what we mean when we say organizational ergonomics, and then to look at three different aspects at different levels um, of primarily what organizational ergonomics is about. Um, well, not primarily, to give you a taste of what uh, organizational ergonomics is about. And of course, it does a lot more things than just those three things which I'm going to talk about. The definition of organizational ergonomics, uh, if we're pulling it off the International Ergonomics Association's website, is that it considers structures, policies, and processes of an organization. And the goal of organizational ergonomics is to achieve a harmonized system, a harmonized system taking into consideration the consequences of particularly technology on human relationships, processes, and organizations. So a lot of the things that both uh, Steve and Kathy were talking about uh, are related to organizational ergonomics. As Andrew alluded to in his, in his opening, these issues are not separate from one another. 
And the, the particular aspect of organizational ergonomics, which links these three things with these other two areas together is what we might call context. Organizational ergonomics looks at the context in which work is taking place. So whether that is heavily physical work, heavily cognitive work, or as we've shown through the two presentations beforehand, a little bit of both, both physical and cognitive work, and looks at how that work is done within a particular context. And the types of contexts which ergonomics, uh, organizational ergonomics looks at are organizational systems, although the same type of thinking which we can apply to organizational systems can also be applied to many other systems. In fact, the, the types of systems that I personally look at in, in my work uh, extend beyond organizational systems to look at things like environmental systems um, and systems, for example, in city context. This diagram uh, was originally produced by a well-known uh, ergonomist by the name of Neville Murray, uh, who was attempting to demonstrate the different levels at which human factors in ergonomics operate. So the types of things which we've looked at so far um, are the physical ergonomics and, and cognition. And those are, in this particular slide, the, the, the second and the third blocks. What I'm going to be talking about is the broader context of which uh, these types of interactions take place. And that's at the team and the organizational level, and particularly looking at the, how we can arrange all of the different processes. But of course, organizational ergonomics, like all other areas of, of human factors in ergonomics, comes all the way down to the individual too. So we're not ignoring the individual in that. We're looking at how the individual operates within a particular context an organization or some other type of system context. So what do we do in organizational ergonomics? Here I give a range of different things all the way through from simple design of work, all the way through to the design of whole organizations and how organizations are put together and in fact, inter-organizational management. So at a very basic level, we might look at, for example, how the features of work might be designed to be able to accommodate various different types of physical and cognitive demands within an organizational or some other type of context. At the work schedule design, we look at when and where work might happen. In the psychophysical work environment, we might look at who you're interacting with and the implications of those interactions. Uh, Matt, uh, Kathleen looked at that partly in relation to teaming and, and, um, and how teams of human beings, for example, on the flight deck of an airplane might be able to communicate and convey information to one another. We look at participatory designs and involving people in the designs, the, the people who are going to use the designs in the involvement of the designs. We look at new ways of doing work. And that, that's uh, one of the examples which I'll give towards the end of my presentation how we ensure quality in there, and also how we might look at designing whole organizations or whole change management processes as we go through, for example, the, uh, an intervention in, an, in a whole organization and how we might get that, that organization to operate optimally. At the work design level, and this is where I'm gonna go into this, uh, one of the ones which, which I'm gonna look at in a little bit more detail. What we look at is how do we change the characteristics of the job in order to ensure efficient functioning in that job. Efficient in terms of the well-being of the individual and efficient and productive in terms of the needs of the organization. So that would be how much work is being done, what type of work, what skills are needed, how difficult is that job? And to look at how we might be able to either redesign that job to be able to cope with these various different demands or provide different types of tools um, and, and or automation and or artificial intelligence to be able to assist the person in actually doing, the person or the people in actually doing those jobs. Another aspect of work design is to look at when and where work is done. Next, I'll cover in the next slide when I talk about uh, work scheduling. And we'll need to look at the interpersonal aspects of the work, um, how management structures uh, and support structures are put into put in place to enable a person to to do work. In Steve's example earlier, for example, talking about the um, that piece of technology for removing 
uh, a patient from, from an ambulance, there are a large number of interpersonal aspects that need to take place in those types of environments, particularly with first responders and emergency personnel who have to make a, a range of decisions about who does what. And to do that under an incredibly stressful uh, and time constrained uh, circumstances. And so we need to look at how we might design those types of, of situations to enable and facilitate the interpersonal aspects to, to ensure efficient outcomes um, for everyone concerned, including the first responders. You don't want everyone, for example, rushing to the same patient at an accident scene. You want to make sure that their, their work is distributed in an effective and efficient way to save as many lives as possible in certain circumstances or to make sure that you have a positive outcome for everyone in other circumstances. We might also look at a larger organizational level at the management and leadership climate. Um, how do we make sure that, uh, that the management and leadership create a climate of good working relationships to ensure efficient and effective uh, performance of work in their organization and how that get, gets conveyed to various different people in the organization. And finally, at a large level, we might look at the design and the structure of the organization. Is this optimum for the type of work that an organization is doing? Some organizations, for example, require a flatter structure um, with greater types of horizontal communications, whereas other organizations might require a more hierarchical type of structure um, that facilitates a top-down version of instructions so that the people at the bottom can, can, uh, of the organization can get those instructions in a clear and unambiguous way. So you'd have to look very carefully at what the organization is doing and what it's trying to achieve and look at that in the context and um, the social and the environmental context in which that is taking place. The types of things we can change in an organization uh, at the task level, these include things like decision-making latitude, Al, can you switch it off? Um, and work methods and autonomy, as well as skill variety and work scheduling the autonomy of, of the work, the job complexity, specializations, problem solving, etc. At the relationship level, that includes both, um, both at a horizontal level and at a vertical level, we can look at the level of relationship dependence and independence, as well as a feedback from, from others, the type of social support that we need and the types of communications that are, that are taking place. And we also need to look at the physical characteristics that we can change, the physical work demands, the physical work conditions like the lighting and the ventilation, etc. When we look at work scheduling, what we're doing is we're looking at where and when work takes place. Alternatively, we might look at when and, and where breaks need to happen within the work, work time. With the increase in technology, uh, we get, uh, and particularly over the COVID pandemic in, uh, circumstances, we started seeing a lot more flexi time and flexi place types of types of work. Before that, uh, our, our uh, where and when was usually associated with things like shift work, which includes pilots flying airplanes, deciding who's going to fly and when they're going to fly, where they're going to fly to be able to optimize both the efficiency of the airline as well as the a reduction in um, in, in uh, well-being, making sure that you don't have a reduction in well-being for those pilots. Now we're starting to see a lot more different types of work styles coming through. And on the next slide, I'll talk about some of those, but they include a lot more flexible types of work schedules like job sharing and part-time, and also the formality or the informality of the relationships which individuals, individual workers might have with their organization and sometimes even across organizations. So the types of things we'll be looking at is trying to ensure that we reduce the amount of spillover of work situations into non-work activities so that people can, can, uh, can get the right type of rest. We need to make sure that we look at how mobile technologies can be used for the benefit of human beings. Um, we need to look at what happens in dual income families and in single parent families what happens with migrant workers and those people who have long commutes to work um, or have to travel long distances overseas or across national boundaries. And what's happening with our demands in society and particularly within an industry 4.0 type of scenario is we're seeing a global 
first of all, global interactions between companies and also 24 seven demands for both products and services. When your internet service goes down, it's 11 o'clock at night and you're watching a, a, a big football game, you wanna be able to pick up the telephone and be able to phone someone and, and, and get a service to be able to restore your internet service. You don't want to wait until the morning until everyone else is awake. And so this creates a, a various different types of demands. Uh, here's just a couple of pictures about what this might mean in in a homework environment uh, when when people are are given this huge amounts of flexibility it means that we are on our mobile phones or doing work 24 7 and we need to ensure that we create through organizational ergonomics work systems that prevent this type of thing from happening there are also a number of emergent work schedules that are coming up, and they largely fall into two different categories. Work which is precarious, usually things like uh, temporary work or on-call work, work that is outsourced, day hire, and something uh, and, and some, some other types of work forms in a similar type of way. Uh, gig work is another one of those. And then there are other types of work systems which create irregular, flexible, but uh, very difficult to, to have control over, uh, and they, we call those irregular work hours. These include things like zero-hour contracts, uh, working in overtime, compressed work weeks, and also part-time and flexi-time types of work arrangements. The other thing that we must remember both with both these two categories is that while there are possibly significant risks, there are also situations where there may be employment benefits too. And these types of systems, uh, work scheduling systems, allow us to bring other people into the workforce who might not always have been able to be in the workforce because of either some type of uh, limitation, like let's say, for example, raising kids, um, or alternatively, some type of, of physical limitation, like for example, they live far away from work or they have some type of um, physical impairment that prevents them from, from doing work in, in all situations. So we need to look at both the, the positives and the negatives of these different types of, of emerging and emergent work scheduling systems. The last thing I wanna look at and, and look at very quickly because I'm aware that we're running very close to time is to look at something which is called organizational design and management, uh, an area which, which I tend to work in. Essentially what we're doing with organizational design and management is looking at designing large types of work systems, either at an organizational level and sometimes even across organizational levels, like in the, in the case of a, of a hospital, where you might have multiple organizations all synchronized in, in a similar type of workspace. And there are two different types of things which we can design in these in, in, in ODAM. And they is, those are the personnel subsystem, in other words, the people, and the technological subsystem, in other words, all the bits of technology and tools which enable us to do that. And that all occurs within a specific organizational structure. So we can look at two different ways in which we can optimize that. Who prefer, performs what work and when do they perform that work, their behaviors, their interactions, both as individuals and as teams. And the technical subsystems, the tools, the tasks and the processes and how, they, and how these two subsystems, the personal subsystem and technological subsystem interact within the organizational structure. And all of this must also be considered within the environment in which is taking place usually happening through participatory approaches where we involve the people who are doing the work in the actual design itself. This is a diagram that's far too uh, complex to be able to describe in, uh, in detail. Really just what I want to say around this is that when we're looking at uh, designing through organizational design and management is that we're looking at a number of different aspects. First of all, we're looking at what are the inputs coming into our system uh, from the environment and from the work that's being performed uh, within the organizational setting or within the, the type of system that we're trying to change, what are the transformation processes, what takes place inside the system, and what do we want to produce at the other end? And that is done through something which we call the performance outputs. What are the types of outcomes which we want to achieve? This particular diagram is taken from, um, from some work uh, which which we call uh, and one of the systems which which help us do this and this is essentially exactly what I've been talking about and this one over here is called called seeps uh, seeps version two essentially what we're doing is we're looking at the work system the tools the people 
and what they do within that particular organization, how that gets transformed through people to produce patients and caregiver outcomes that are both desirable and optimizing the human beings in doing that work. So essentially what I'm doing, and I realize I've, I've run out of time and I apologize for that. So to give you a little bit of a taste of the, the range of different type of work which we would do in, in, in organizational ergonomics and also how it integrates with both cognitive and physical ergonomics, which you heard talked about earlier. And with that, I'll hand over, hand my hand back to, to Andrew to see the questions which are now starting to come in. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, thank you very much to all three of our presenters, Steve, Kathy, and Andrew, for your very succinct and uh, to the point uh, presentations on what it means to be doing human factors and ergonomics. Uh, please, if there's anyone has further questions, please put them into the Q&A for us. Uh, there is one from Hannah Barton that I think is a useful one for us to discuss. And that is, how would you define macroergonomics? And how does that fit with what you've touched on today? Uh, Andrew, you've got your hand up, go for it. Um, yeah, so uh, it was one of the things which I, which I, I meant to introduce. Uh, thanks very much, Hannah, for the question, by the way. Um, it was one of the things I meant to introduce when I talked about um, organizational ergonomics is that particularly at the larger organizational uh, level, that is typically another name for, for that type of work is macroergonomics. Um, of course, there is a certain amount of definitional ambiguity that's taking place here because uh, it isn't only macroergonomics isn't only at the level of organizations. It can actually be both at a smaller level and at a larger level than organizations. But generally, we use macroergonomics to describe something at a much larger level than at an individual or a team level. Andrew, there's a, a follow-up question, which is, are there any guidelines for the implementations of or use of macroergonomics assessments? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, many. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, most, uh, the most comprehensive one is, um, I think is, is called MAS, M-A-S. It stands for Macroergonomic Assessment System, I think. Um, but anyone who has any questions, I don't have that information at my fingertips at the moment, uh, the references, for example. Um, but um, but there, there is quite a lot of work uh, that was done on providing the assessments, a variety of assessment tools. There's no standardization for which tools should be used because a lot of it is, with many of the areas of ergonomics, is con context dependent. Um, and also depending on what type of, of uh, cognitive or physical factors are, are appropriate at, at any particular time. But but there are, there are sets of guidelines uh, published in the 1990s and uh, extended through to the, to the early 2000s. I haven't followed up in, in the, the 2010s. Certainly, if you're operating in the, um, in the healthcare space, SEEPS is a, is a great tool to use to be able to identify the issues and be able to uh, assess what is going on. If I could just add, there are some other tools that assess kind of organizational maturity level yeah. you know and what point is the organization what is it ready to do kind of you know is it ready for full-blown human factors uh implementations or where where is it so, so that's another form of macro ergonomics assessment yeah and then there's, there's another one which i think relates to that and and that relates to this idea of um psychosocial work environment and ergonomics We have uh, the IEA has published a, a, a document with an international labor organization that's called Principles and Guidelines for Human Factors Ergonomics Design and Management of Work Systems. Mm -hmm. And it's available on our website and it has a lot of guidance for how you would implement HFE into a work system. And we're, we're just about to publish another one that, that deals with uh, human factors and manual handling in the workplace. So those are some other resources for people to use. Yeah, and I think it would be interesting to add, and Steve, we are interested in your opinion on this, when it comes to this idea of psychosocial work environment, we can actually go from Andrew's presentation around organizational factors 
that play an important role in the emergent psychosocial work environment that actually interacts with the physical environment, that interact with both the physical demands and cognitive demands of the task. And it's those complex interactions that lead to the perception of the task. And it is that perception that is interpreted by the individual. And so things like psychosocial work environment can actually play a very important role in influencing perceptions and therefore the interpretation of the task. And it's the task interpretation that goes to the brain, the command center. And it is that that the musculoskeletal response, the magnitude, the sequencing of muscle, uh, based upon that interpretation, your history, your genetic uh, predisposition, your personality, uh, the biomechanical or biochemical status uh, of the body, all interacting to get that response. Yeah, uh, and thanks for, for sort of looping me in here. Um, I'm actually just, you know, just I'm taking an opportunity to share a resource we've been working on recently that speaks exactly to this, Andrew. Um, and I think, you know, from the physical ergonomics lens, we've we've often focused on the right side here. We're really focused on some of these physical hazards, but there's, like you mentioned, very clear links between some of those physical factors and psychosocial factors and the process by which you'd evaluate and intervene and make changes on physical. The process is very consistent with how you might inter interact and deal with, with psychosocial factors. So I think for, for folks in the call that are in a position to be implementing programs or exploring programs, these don't need to be two isolated programs. And in fact, probably shouldn't be. There is a lot of overlap and a nice kind of marriage between those. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Andrew, I see your hands up, go for it. Um, no, I was just, uh, um, just in, the, in the open questions, I noticed uh, there was uh, someone who, uh, Alawi had noticed that the IA checklist spreadsheet doesn't seem to work. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that's the one on the IEA website, because it also seems to imply that it's not in English either. So um, I'm not 100% sure which uh, which checklist spreadsheets Alara is looking at, but maybe that's just something to look into. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Are there any other questions? Then... Yeah, I noticed we answered some uh we answered some, some more uh, plan. No, 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 that's so. perfect. No, no, that's good. No problem. Um, yeah, and, and I think there's just a comment around uh, medical device manufacturing and usability. Um, and, and that actually, you know, from the presentations, that makes it uh, a little bit easier uh, with, uh, I think, as one of your slides, Andrew, um, from an organizational perspective. Yeah. Um, there are no more comments from me. Any of the speakers who want to add some final thoughts on what is HFE? Um, okay, there was the, Alawi just posted the, the drink. I'll have a yeah. look at that now. I noticed there was a question from uh, Letitia Albert in the uh, Q&A. Yeah, that was the one I was talking about, the medical devices. It's more a comment than, okay. a, than a question. Okay. Yeah. And those are those are question about um, AI and how how do we keep the human uh, the system human system design when you're talking about artificial intelligence and that that is going to be a really important issue and I think nations and organizations are struggling right now to figure out ahead of time you know what how AI should be designed and what are the things that you need to facilitate and guard against and how should it be used how should it be created and I think human factors and ergonomics has a huge role to play from all you know the levels that we're talking about today and the design of these new systems and so I hope I hope that the same kinds of principles that we use for the design of other work systems are, are also applied to AI. Andrew anything more from you? Uh, no, I also res responded to that one. Uh, there was a there's a wonderful talk by uh, Mike Ensley on uh, yes. the IEA's YouTube channel, which is also worthwhile going and having having a look at. In fact, there are two talks: one by Paul Salmon and one by uh, Mike. Um, and th those are those are very very worthwhile to go go and have a look at if you're looking for specific aspects. Um, I think it's probably also worthwhile just showing that this is really just an introduction to the types of things which we're doing. We've tried to emphasize the 
the systemic nature of human factors and ergonomics through our three presentations. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot more <laughs> behind mm -hmm. ergonomics from aspects. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, if anyone would, li would like, uh, welcome to kind of follow up with, with the IEA around uh, any questions that you might have around specific aspects of human factors and ergonomics mm -hmm. or, or any particular topic areas. I think there are uh, 27 or 28 um, uh, technical yeah. committees focusing mm -hmm. on different aspects, specialized aspects of human factors and ergonomics. Right, including your sustainability, uh, kind of things that we didn't about. talk about so much today and yeah. you know environmental yeah. issues yeah they're not divorced from one another and they involve all the different types of ergonomics yeah perfect and uh, steve anything else from you uh, there, there's a, a really nice comment there just uh, appreciating the work that you guys do on msd prevention so uh, yeah. Uh, th thanks, uh, Alawi, for the for the comment. Always nice to hear some kind words. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for taking time to attend today. It's always exciting yes. to have these conversations. And, you know, even for me, it was great to present, but also great to hear from Kathleen and Andrew and, and Andrew. And uh, it's such an exciting integrated discipline. So uh, very exciting. Indeed. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and I think just as a conclusion, I, I think one of the strengths of what makes HFE good is that we are multidisciplinary and we all come from different backgrounds with different strengths. And uh, through these collaborative, participatory, multidisciplinary approaches, we, we can really get unique insights into what problems are and what the solutions to those problems should be. So to our panelists, uh, Andrew, Steve, and Kathy, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. It's been fantastic having you on this evening. Uh, to Maggie for organizing it for us, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that brings our formal uh, discussions to an end. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. Uh, Please keep interacting with us. And if you have any queries, pop onto our website and uh, send us some messages and we'll be happy to interact with you. So from our side, thank you very much. And uh, uh, if you're in certain parts of the world, have a great morning. Uh, <laughs> in other parts of the world, have a great evening. Thank you very much and goodbye. Yes, thanks very much, everyone.